My name is Hans van der Kwast. In this video I'm going to explain the physical basis of thermal remote sensing. After this lecture you'll be able to describe the electromagnetic spectrum, describe the physical laws of Stefan Boltzmann and Wien, define a black body, and explain emissivity. With thermal remote sensing we can detect heat. This can be best illustrated by looking at a volcano. Here we see an Aster image during an eruption of Mount Etna in July 2001. We see an image with a visual and near infrared. Everything in red indicates healthy vegetation. The black parts are destroyed by the volcano eruption. But what we can't see is the direction of the lava flow. Now we replace one channel with a thermal infrared band of the same satellite. And there we can clearly see that the direction of the lava flow is towards the south. This is helpful for evacuation or damage assessment. But where in the electromagnetic spectrum can we find the thermal infrared? This picture shows from left to right the electromagnetic spectrum from short wave to long waves. Short wavelengths from gamma rays to UV are harmful for humans, but they're also mostly blocked by the atmosphere. Then we have the visible part of the spectrum which has all the colors that we can see with our eyes, with the three receptors, red, green, and blue. A bit further to the right, we find the infrared, which can be split in the near infrared, which is uh, mostly reflection from healthy vegetation. Then we have the shortwave infrared, and the right side of the infrared part of the spectrum is the thermal infrared, which is the objective of this lecture. Further to the right, we find useful wavelengths for uh, human purposes, such as microwave and uh, the radio waves. Also, Wi-Fi and mobile phone communication is in this part of the spectrum. All objects at a temperature above the absolute zero, which is zero Kelvin or minus 273 degrees Celsius, emit electromagnetic radiation as a result of the movement of their atoms and molecules. This picture gives you a bit of an idea of the scale of the wavelengths. So if an object is cooler, then the wavelengths are much shorter uh, compared to um, atomic nuclei or atoms. And if we go to uh, warmer temperatures, ambient temperatures, then uh, the wavelengths are uh, longer and they are mostly in the thermal infrared for the objects around us. The picture also shows uh, which wavelengths can penetrate the Earth's atmosphere. In order to understand the physical theory presented in the next slides, it's important to define a black body. A black body is an idealized physical body that absorbs all the incident electromagnetic radiation regardless of its frequency or angle of incidence. The spectrum of such a black body in thermal equilibrium is determined by its temperature alone. This is defined with Planck's law. That is because a black body is an ideal emitter and it's also a diffuse emitter. That the amount of energy emitted by an object is related to its temperature is well defined by Stefan Boltzmann's law. This law states that the total energy radiated per unit surface of a black body across all wavelengths per unit time, J star, is directly proportional to the fourth power of the black body's thermodynamic temperature, T. And here you see that in the Stefan Boltzmann's equation, where sigma is the Stefan Boltzmann constant. When we look at the electromagnetic spectrum of a black body at different temperatures, we find that the higher the temperature, the shorter the wavelength of the peak of its emission. And this is defined by Wien's displacement law, which basically states that the peak of the wavelength equals Wien's displacement constant B divided by temperature. With Wien's law, we can determine the temperature of objects by measuring their electromagnetic spectrum. In this example, we see the constellation of Orion, and we can determine the temperature of its stars by measuring the electromagnetic spectrum. Before we go to Earth, let's have a look at our own star, the Sun. With a temperature of the Sun of 5250 degrees Celsius, we can construct the black curve, which is a black body spectrum. However, in reality, the sun is a real object and not a black body. The yellow curve shows the sunlight at the top of the atmosphere, which deviates a bit from the black body spectrum. What is received at the surface of the Earth is depicted in the red curve. 
We can see, however, that the red curve has some uh, very low values in certain parts of the spectrum. This is because those areas of the electromagnetic spectrum are blocked by gases in the atmosphere. The areas where the red curve is high are called atmospheric windows, where the atmosphere is relatively transparent for the radiation. We can also see in the curve that the peak of the electromagnetic radiation of the sun is in the visible part of the spectrum, which means that our eyes with the red, green and blue receptors are well adapted to the peak emission of solar energy. Now let's move to Earth and have a look at the electromagnetic spectrum emitted by Earth objects. The temperatures of Earth objects range from the coolest Arctic ice of 220 Kelvin to molten lava of 5400 Kelvin. Because of their temperature, the peak radiation of Earth objects is mostly in the thermal infrared part of the spectrum, which is far from the shorter wavelengths of the Sun, and therefore they can easily be distinguished. Until now we've been looking at physical laws that are based on black bodies. Real materials, however, do not behave as black bodies. We need to correct using emissivity, which is the emitting ability of a real material compared to that of a black body. It can be calculated by taking the radiant excitance of an object at a given temperature divided by the radiant excitance of a black body at the same temperature. It has a value between 0 and 1 and it can vary with different wavelengths, viewing angle or even temperature itself for some materials, which makes it a very difficult property. Besides black bodies, we can define gray bodies, which have an emissivity less than 1 and is constant at all wavelengths. We can also define selective radiators that have an emissivity that varies with its wavelength. To be practical with remote sensing, when we use broadband thermal sensors, we consider the emissivity to be constant for the objects in the 8 to 14 micrometer range that is used by thermal sensors. Under conditions of thermal equilibrium, Kirchhoff's radiation law describes that reflectance, absorptance and emissivity are related to each other. The emissivity of an object equals its absorptance, and therefore bodies with high absorption have a high emissivity. This is under the assumption that objects are opaque to thermal radiation, meaning that tau transmissivity equals uh, zero. Therefore emissivity and reflectance are complementary and equal to one when they are summed. In the equation, rho is the reflectance of the object. Now if we look at the figure, we can see in figure A that the emissivity is high compared to B, and in that condition we see also that the absorptance is high, because according to Kirchhoff's radiation law, emissivity equals the absorptance. We can also see, in the case of high emissivity, that the reflectance is lower because emissivity and reflectance are complementary and add up to one. When we look at the figure on the right side, we see therefore that when emissivity is low, the absorptance is much lower, and we see that the reflectance is higher. Here we see some typical emissivity values in the 8 to 13 micrometer range for vegetation, soils and uh, aluminum. We can see that for crops, we often have to look at the third decimal to see uh, the differences. It's very important to have an accurate value of emissivity because for real objects we need to modify Stefan Boltzmann's law for energy uh, by multiplying the law by emissivity. And we can see that uh, temperature is to the power of 4 and therefore a little difference in emissivity will have a huge impact on the calculated amount of energy. Let's have a look at an example. Here we took a thermal image from a can that was 24 hours in the fridge. We can assume that it's at thermal equilibrium. However, from the image we can see that the can is not homogeneously chilled. The question is why this is the case. Now let's have a look at the true color image of the can. We can see that the coating is damaged and that the bare aluminum is exposed. And the emissivity of the coating and of the bare aluminum is different. And therefore when we take a thermal image, we can see that the temperature is different if we don't compensate for the emissivity differences of the material. Measuring temperatures with a thermal sensor is different than using a thermometer. With a thermometer we measure kinetic temperature, which is the contact temperature that we measure as a result of the moving molecules. The radiance temperature measured by thermal sensors is different and need to be corrected for the emissivity of the object. 
Also for deriving land surface temperature from space with remote sensing requires that we have the emissivity. Since it's very difficult to measure emissivity directly, we derive it through algorithms that are implemented in software or applied uh, to different products. This slide gives an overview of different methods. This lecture focused on the physical basis of thermal remote sensing. Now you are able to describe the electromagnetic spectrum and show the location of the thermal infrared. You can describe the physical laws of Stefan Boltzmann and Wien and define a black body. You can also explain why emissivity is needed to convert black body temperatures to real body temperatures.